Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Sudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So reading from Canto 7, Chapter 13, The Behavior of a Perfect Person, text number 45. 
Svatmavitam Maidi Madhye Tamte Sugatvam api varnitam. Vyapitam loka sastra bhyam. Bhavan hi bhagavat paraha. Svatmavitam vayetam te. Sugatam api varnitam. Vyapetam loka sastra bhyam. Bhavan hi bhagavat paraha. Atma Vritam. The information of the history of self realization. Maya. By me. Itam. In this way. Te. Unto you. Suguptam. Extremely confidential. Api. Although. Varnitam. Explained. Vyapetam. Without. Loka Shastra Vyam. The opinion of the common man or common literatures. Bhavan. Your good self. He. Indeed. Bhagavat Paraha. Having fully realized the personality of Godhead. <laughs> so I guess the response is coming down from this Python man and now he's speaking to Prahlad. He says, Prahlad Maharaj, you are certainly a self-realized soul and a devotee of the Supreme Lord. You do not care for public opinion or so-called scriptures. For this reason I have described to you without hesitation the history of my self-realization. Shiluk Prabhupada's purport. <clears throat> a person who is actually a devotee of Krishna does not care about so-called public opinion and Vedic or philosophical literatures. Prahlad Maharaj is such a devotee 
who, who is such a devotee, always defied the false instructions of his father and the so-called teachers who were appointed to teach him. Instead, he simply followed the instructions of Narada Muni, his guru, and thus he always remained a stalwart devotee. This is the nature of an intelligent devotee. Hmm, question. The Srimad Bhagavatam instructs, Yadnai Sankirtanai Prayai Yajantihi Sumena Saha. When it was actually very intelligent, must join the Krishna conscious movement, realizing his own self as the eternal servant of Krishna, and thus practice constantly chanting of the holy name of the Lord. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Nagyan Timirandasya Gina Jana Savakaya Chaksu Ungavitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurveda Maha Shri Chaitanya Manovistam Stavtitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Gadam Mayam Dadati Swam Padanti Kam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pestaya Bhutale Shri Bhakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravai Pracharine Nirvishesha Sunyavari Pashtyatya De Satarine Panchakopa Tarubhishya Kripa Sindhu Ve Pacha Patita Nam Bhavane Bhyo Vaishnavi Bhyo Namaho Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadara Sri Vasavi Gaur Bhakta Rinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare hmm. So we, we, the Python man or this very interesting self-realized soul he says <clears throat> about Prahlad Maharaj, because you didn't care for public opinion or so-called scriptures, for this reason I have described to you without hesitation the history of my self-realization. So there's an interesting point there that one who has a certain characteristic or quality uh, invites what we say more transcendental knowledge. And what is that characteristic? Not caring for the worldly opinion that goes on where it becomes something that people find themselves eager to hear about through the news, various types of periodicals, talking to friends and others. They want to know about public opinion, what's going on, what did this politician say, what did that politician, what did this teacher say, what did the experts talk about? Or so-called scriptures, that's those scriptures that don't define the name, fame, form, pastimes, and qualities of the Supreme Lord. As Bhagavatam says, Dharma Projito Kaitavo, those scriptures that can kick out other forms of or scripture which claims to be uh, scripture, but actually mixes in material considerations. The Purusharthas, Arta, Dharma, Kama, and Moksha. So real scripture means uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, <laughs> those scriptures that take you to self-realization or take you to the point of glorifying the Supreme Personality of God in, in, in his many different ways. So this nature of Prahlad Maharaj, who didn't really follow the ways of the world, nor did his teachers, nor his father, or anybody else. He was fixed in his understanding of how to worship the Lord, and it was according to what we say bona fide scripture. Therefore, this Python man, or this personality here who we're talking about, felt inspired to speak about his personal life. And uh, this was interesting because uh, the more one is strict in Krishna consciousness, following exactly according to Guru, Shadu, and Shastra, the more Krishna reveals within the heart, yasya devi para bhaktir, yata devi tata guru, dasyaipa kartitam yata, prakasanatma mahatmanaha, one who has implicit faith, that faith which is never broken in any circumstance due to whatever happens or doesn't happen, uh, in both guru, 
spiritual master and the Lord, then uh, automatically they receive within the heart the realization of the understanding of the conclusion of all scriptures. In other words, they understand what bhakti is about and how to execute it. They know everything that is needed to be known. So this is, uh, so the more we seriously practice Krishna consciousness, the more we become more what we say a confidential servant of the Lord, not just a servant, more confidential. And then more and more knowledge gets revealed by to that person through guru, shadow, sadhu, and of course shastra means Krishna in this in this case. So here, you know, he's Prahlad Maharaj is of that nature, so much so that when he was being uh, harassed by his father, trying to destroy him, because he was so fixed fixed on the understanding that. Now, Krishna is the ultimate source of everything, and he is my protector also. So if Krishna doesn't protect me, there's nobody who can protect me. I can't even protect myself. This is an interesting thing. Sometimes we put, we're, put, we're put into a situation where we think, if I'm in a dangerous situation, will I just simply become like Draupati and throw up my hands and say, Krishna, Krishna, Mahabaho, or, you know, Krishna, Krishna, I'm yours. Or will we be ready to try to defend ourselves in so many different ways? This is an interesting discussion because it depends on the individual, depends on the circumstance, depends on the level of that person's practice. But ultimately, Prahlad Maharaj had no uh, hesitation. He knew, Rake Krishna Moreke, Mode Krishna Rakeke. If Krishna protects, then no one can do anything. And if Krishna doesn't protect, you can have all your armies and they can't do anything. Krishna is the all-powerful, supreme, what we say, all-knowing personality of Godhead. He's always everywhere and fully there for his devotee at all time. And especially here, as it mentions here, Prabhupada gives the conclusion that one should constantly chant the holy names of the Lord. So this is how we associate with Krishna in this age and also feel his protection through the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Otherwise, what, el what other shelter do we have? Our minds, our intelligence, our abilities, whatever we've done in the past to somehow been successful in the endeavors that we undertook. But ultimately, it's, it's really depending on Krishna and taking shelter of Krishna. And here is the, the easy and direct and full and complete shelter of Krishna and his holy name. As I was mentioning just the, uh, I think I mentioned it in class the other night. I got a letter from one of my disciples and he's an Indian man. He has a family, he's in his, yeah, he's in his first 50s. So he drives a, a, the U Uber, you know, you know, he does that driving, hired out driver, you use your own car and then you give a percentage to the company and you keep the rest. So he was on his way to, to work by getting a ride from another driver. And so he was sitting in the back seat and somehow they were on the highway but the, the car started to skid. And then it lost control and, it, and then he was seeing that we were gonna either hit this truck that's coming or we're gonna hit this wall. So he just started to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra loud. <laughs> I guess he had chanted it loud enough so the driver could hear it also. <laughs> and everything was completely changed. The car stopped spinning, the other, the other cars avoided hitting his car. And in fact, the car was, an, uh, was completely untouched. Nobody was hurt, not even the car, not even the scratch. So he wrote me that. And he said, this is the second time Krishna saved me. <laughs> I, I was thinking, don't try for a third, you know. Because <laughs> he used to run a store in, uh, in a very difficult neighborhood in Chicago. <laughs> That's where he lives in Chicago. So, And of course, one man came in with a gun. He pointed it right at me. And he said, you know, give me all your money. <laughs> so he did. But 
you know, sometimes these people, they don't care. They just kill you anyway and take the money. But again, he was, he told me that time he also remembered Krishna, so. So this is the full protection. And this is mentioned here that, uh, as Prahlad Maharaj is an example, how he took shelter completely of Krishna and didn't really care about giving up whatever he felt was his way to worship the Lord and accept instructions of his teachers, instructions of his fathers, or people in general. So we find ourselves today in that situation. There's so much opinion on what is truth and what is not. And it goes on from all sides, coming from the secular world, and sometimes even in our society, we line up with the secular ideas and somehow support that. But therefore, Prabhupada, in one statement, he says, whatever Krishna says, that's all we care about. <laughs> so really, of course, we have to live in the practical sense of the term too, but Krishna gives you the intelligence when you engage in devotional service to, under, to understand how to live your life in such a way as that you can maximize your the effects of your activities in such a way that you can become Krishna conscious. Sometimes we just perform devotional service, but it's like it's like being stuck in a snowstorm. We're, we're just spinning our wheels sometimes. We're doing a lot of work, we're doing a lot of chanting, we're doing a lot of whatever we're doing. We're not making much advancement. Therefore, it, sometimes it takes really calling out for Krishna and praying to Krishna and, and begging Krishna to please guide me, to please protect me, please under, give me the understanding of how I can serve you in such, in, in such a way that it'll be satisfying to you. So the devotee finds themselves, you know, a lot of times just spending years, sometimes years, without making any real tangible advancement. Unless we really have to call out for Krishna and the spiritual master and beg for their mercy. And that leads us to the mercy we need, either comes directly from the Lord and his devotee or through the agencies of Sadhu Sangha. In any form or way, the Lord will always help his devotee who sincerely prays for, for mercy. So, uh, Therefore, this is where our shelter is, in full, full faith in the Lord, and not in the worldly things that we hear. There are so many opinions, this opinion, that opinion. Yata mata, tata pata, I'm okay, you're okay, he's okay, she's okay, he's not okay, I think he's okay. Yesterday, he's not okay, but today he's okay. <laughs> so, you know, everything has changed, this world. And Prabhupada always smashed that, how the secular society always is changing their opinions on everything. Somebody, one day they have so many opinions about what is the, the theory or some scientific discovery or some medicine or something, whatever they come up with, and then we find soon it has a different scripture, a different opinion. Because they're on the mental platform. And when you're on the mental platform, it's all speculation. And you, your knowledge is empirical. But we know the senses are imperfect. So empirical observation or research into understanding is always fraught with mistakes because the living entity has what? One of those four defects. It becomes illusioned, cheating, commits mistakes, imperfect senses. So to accept knowledge from people who have those uh, characteristics, or let me de what you might say defects, is putting oneself in a dangerous position, mm -hmm. or in a very uh, ignorant position. Therefore, we have to accept the knowledge coming from Shastra, from Guru, and those who are engaged in devotional service, who are fixed in the process of devotional service who have realized the process of devotional service by their own practice. They, we can also accept knowledge from all of these different avenues, but not from the secular world. It's always changing, changing, changing. One thing that is constant about the material world is called change. Change is the only constant. 
Everything is always changing. And um, people live for change because the material energy is not very satisfying. And therefore, people find it difficult to keep doing the same thing. And you see how that change increases even in the area of relationships. Mm -hmm. Especially, it used to be people would change um, material things, you know, getting something better, something new on a material level. But now it's become a feature of life where people see people as commodities. So they change accordingly. If, you know, if I don't like my wife or it's not working, then get another one. <laughs> Our friends, also friends like that. So many things people change for whatever reason. Instead of trying to solve the problems or work it out, sometimes they make an effort. But a lot of times they find it's easier to change but it's not ne necessarily beneficial. Like we, we, were, we were hearing many years ago that the, in the United States of America, you get all your statistics from there because they're always giving statistics on something because <laughs> that's another thing they have nothing to do so to find out what's, what's right and what's wrong. <laughs> so they were you know, giving statistics on marriages and divorces. So they found that 70% uh, of marriages end in divorce after the average of three years. And people generally get married two or three times. I think it's decreased since then because now people don't get married, so there's not so many divorces. They call it, they call it living together and not risking the idea of having to go to court and, and then fighting over possessions or fighting over this and that. You just make an agreement and if we decide to break it, then you go on your way and I go on my way and there's no legal things and we'll, we'll divide the property according to, <laughs> accordingly to what you brought in and what I brought in and whatever we gained between us, we can divide that too. <laughs> so, you know, this is you know, how, how life goes on. And I know, even I know devotees who say, well, I, this is my partner, you know. <laughs> oh, really? Interesting. I don't know what that, I guess I know what it means. It means it's like somebody you, you could have married, but you didn't. Because <laughs> it's not a, it's too difficult to go through that, you know. But marriage is a, san is a sanctimony. It's actually created by the Supreme Lord in order to quell the population's restlessness and focusing that on one person and therefore developing family life, which is the foundation for secular society. But now people don't care about that. <coughs> and it's, it's the society is pretty much going to hell. I was just mentioning how in, in your country you're still catching up with all the degradation yet. It'll come, don't worry. <laughs> it's a little slower than the rest of the world. And that was the benefit of communism. Wherever communism was, especially in the European countries, people weren't so exposed to all the nonsense that were there in capitalistic countries with all of the varieties of free enterprise and so many things. And people were more family-oriented and more focused on you know, values Although there was a restriction by the authoritative government, still that restriction allowed for a lot of nonsense not to come in. <laughs> but now it's all free, it's all nonsense will come in, so you'll start to become more aware that people, because you know, I just, I noticed that now, even some of the young kids here in Slovenia, they like rock and roll music coming from America. I heard a few of them talking about it in English. <laughs> so yeah, so now it's all, it's all, you know, pour it on, it's, it's all new stuff, it looks good, you know. But uh, it's the same old thing, it just diverts one's attention away from 
the important things of life. It's not even the mode of goodness, it's, mode of, it's the lower modes. But here, yeah, back to the, to the point here, is that one should take instructions from Guru, Shadow, and Shastra, or those who are on the level of that, of those three, on the level of at least Guru and, sa and Sadhu, like that. And hear from them, and not from the, you know, whatever goes on in the world as truth. <laughs> And you know, of course, when you actually get down to the actual uh, philosophical teachings of Shastra, there's no truth in the material world. I remember I met one person I was preaching, and he was a new person, I never saw him before. He was quite, quite opinionated about whatever he believed in. And he said that the thing that's wrong in the world, and he kept saying it over and over, is that people don't tell the truth. So I agreed with him in principle, but then I said, well, well how do we know what is the truth? <laughs> it doesn't matter. He said, people have to be honest. <laughs> I said, well, well then, you know, what is, what, what is honest, and what is truth, and what is not truth? And then I tried to explain to him you know, the Vedic conception or Vedic definition of truth that something that doesn't change. Couldn't handle that. <laughs> Couldn't handle that. Because his conception of truth was, you know, whatever I believe to be right, that's truth. <laughs> like that. So yeah, and so we have, and as they say, wherever you find a person, you'll find an opinion. So many people, so many opinions. <laughs> so yeah, therefore, in order to stay chaste, we have to hear from Srila Prabhupada. And you know, it's amazing. Well, of course, you, all, you already know. But the more you listen to Srila Prabhupada's lectures, the more he tells you everything about everything. All, all sciences and all aspects of society are found in Srila Prabhupada's teachings from medicine to, you know, to fighting, to practical etiquette on how to live, to family life, to values, astrology, everything. All the, all the sciences, all the topics that people are interested, Prabhupada spoke at it, on it, either directly in, a converse, in, in his lectures or in conversations with his devotees who always like to bring up controversial topics with Prabhupada just to see how he would respond to them. It was always interesting. Prabhupada liked that. He liked when devotees would bring up challenging points so he could defeat it. <laughs> he liked that. And the devotees brought up some really <laughs> I mean, they, challenging things. And, you know, and some of the times they didn't even agree with Prabhupada's conclusions. <laughs> Like when Prabhupada said, we didn't go to the moon. <laughs> he said, I said that when I first came to America in 1969. They asked me in a radio station in California. And I told the, the, the uh, radio announcer they didn't go to the moon. <laughs> but we had one devotee, he was sure we went to the moon. I mean, he was dead sure. And he, would, he couldn't accept Prabhupada's statement that we didn't go to the moon. So one time, and this was in the early days, and this was a very early devotee, um, Palika, who was Prabhupada's cook, was cooking in the kitchen. And she put the ghee on the fire, and she left the kitchen. But the ghee, when she came back, was smoking, and then it started on fire. So then she called for help, and this person who was the one that about the moon, he came to help. So they brought a fire extinguishing and one of those you know, foam things they shoot. So you, you, you don't do that on ghee. <laughs> it's just the ghee and the fire was all over the place. You know? so, so it was a mess. 
they finally put it out, but all their clothes were black. <laughs> so, so the word got back to Prabhupada that something happened in the kitchen, so he called Palika immediately. She came, and she was in that same state, along with this devotee. I can't remember his name. Purushatam. Huh? Purushatam. Purushatam, yeah, that was his devotee. <laughs> and when Prabhupada saw Purushatam, he looked at him, he said, Oh, Purushatam, you went to the moon. <laughs> <laughs> of course, he didn't feel so, you know, happy about that. <laughs> so, you know, Prabhupada was pretty good at making, putting you in your place, you know. <laughs> yeah, and, and from many other things Prabhupada said also, devotees couldn't, I mean, the fifth canto was a, a real challenge for some devotees, especially those who had scientific backgrounds. Uh, even today, today I know some devotees who still can't accept the fifth canto. And even the arrangements that we've made for the TOVP, some of them are against the, the, the uh, decided arrangements. I met one person who said, I don't like the, the whole idea. <laughs> He said, it's not according to the scientists. I said, well, howdy bo. <laughs> so yeah, uh, you know, we get indoctrinated. And, you know, we, st we st Prabhupada said, yeah, the sun is 93 million miles away. We can accept that. <laughs> we can accept that. <laughs> so because, you know, he just said that. But the fact that the moon is farther away from the earth than the sun, oh, you know, that's a tough one. <laughs> the moon looks like it's so close, <laughs> and the sun looks like it's more farther. Well, it depends on your, whether you're, you know, what what perception you have. But that one they couldn't understand. Prabhupada really argued that point so many times. So Prabhupada did things that were contrary to scientific news, scientific and so-called conclusions. And it's still going on today. We don't have Prabhupada to smash it <laughs> like we did before. <laughs> so somebody has to smash some of the garbage that comes out here. <laughs> Using Prabhupada's, you know, uh, guidelines, and also you know, one has to use their intelligence because it's the same thing. The scientists and the plan makers and the academicians, they're all their knowledge is imperfect. Uh, we accept what comes from, what we say, bona fide sources. Okay, so we'll stop here and see if there's any comments questions. Do you have any scientists here? Yeah. Well, <laughs> 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 like, well, yeah, that's true. Because <laughs> we know the supreme science. <laughs> Self-realization. <laughs> Mananta, you look like you're formulating a question. <laughs> no? Okay, no questions. All right, so thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai.